All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Value Exchange. Today's webinar. Um, we'll just give it a couple of quick seconds um, for everyone else to join in. We've got a couple of people in the waiting room and then we will get started. In the meantime, if you're having any issues seeing me, hearing me, please drop a comment in the chat and we'll make sure it's sorted before we kick off. All right, the awkward silence has gone on long enough. So <laughs> let me let me begin by very briefly introducing myself. Hi everyone, my name is Hannah. I'm the VP of Marketing here at Zeotap. I am gonna be leading the discussion for today. And I'm very lucky to be joined by my colleague, Florian, our Chief Business Officer, who is dialing in from somewhere much sunnier from where I am. Uh, Florian, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Hannah. Hey, I'm Florian. I'm responsible for our global partnerships business at Zeotap. Um, I've been with the company for quite a while and also am very lucky, actually, to be responsible for a legal and privacy team. So, um, yeah, very glad to discuss this important topic today with you. And excited to have you on board because you know much more about it than I do. So we're going to be hearing a lot from you Let's in the see. course of this discussion today. Great. OK, so a quick run through of the agenda for everyone. So first things first, we'll do a couple of bits of housekeeping. It will be dull, but it won't take very long. And then we will get into the meat of today's discussion. And that is going to run through, I think, four or five different sections. The first of which is just going to be a quick check in on the reality of data privacy, setting the scene and giving us a landscape before we get stuck into the findings of the report. So these will look at privacy as, first of all, a purchase driver, secondly, a retention driver, and lastly, a profit driver. So all of those things will go through in turn and then finish up with a quick to-do list based on all of those learnings. So the housekeeping part, I'll keep it quick. First of all, we would love to get your questions um, and please submit them throughout the course of today's presentation. We'll get to as many as humanly possible at the end. There is a questions panel on one side of your screen. I'm not sure which side I'm pointing to at the moment, but hopefully it's fairly self-evident. Please submit them there and we'll take as many as we can at the end. Secondly, like I was saying before, if you've got any technical issues or any other questions as we go, please use the chat functionality that you can see on the same side. And again, we'll try and make sure that we address all of those in good time. And finally, the question that always comes up, yes, the recording will be sent to you afterwards. So if for some reason the doorbell rings or the dog goes crazy and you have to be distracted for a moment, don't worry, you will be able to catch up later on. Okay, housekeeping bit done. Very quickly an intro to who we are at Zeotap. So our, our main mission is to create unity between data and privacy with the aim of being able to power personal and trusted customer experiences. And we have three different ways of doing that. Number one, Zeotap Fuel, which is our data product. Many of you will have seen this being relaunched just uh, last week, I believe it was, all bells and whistles. Secondly, our CDP, our customer data platform, which obviously unifies data, enhances it, and allows you to activate it across the ecosystem. And then finally, ID+, Plus, our universal ID for the impending cookie-less future. So what makes us a little bit different is we are made in Germany. I personally am not, Florian is. Um, for privacy-sensitive marketers, obviously it's the strictest compliant environment in the entire world. So we wouldn't have made it out of the gate if we didn't have our together. Um, we're also rooted in data rather than marketing automation, and there's about 200 of us worldwide. That's the very quick overview. If you want to see what the whole thing looks like, it's a little bit like this. If you would like to actually understand it, you can come and have a chat with us later on because it's relatively complicated. So today's discussion is all based on one thing, um, a big survey that we conducted at the very tail end of last year amongst 3,000 European consumers. And what we were looking to find was to understand their perception of how brands are handling their data and the questions of privacy therein. This is actually kind of a part two um, of an extended study that we started out um, kind of last summer when we did the first part of our research, which was looking at how marketers and the brand side of things are handling data. So actually across the course of today's discussion, we're gonna compare and contrast those two different viewpoints of the same thing. 
what consumers see versus what marketers see. And we're going to see some very interesting disconnects there um, that give us some pointers on the problems that we need to solve. So the top line before we dig into all of the detail of what we found is number one, consumers are the new regulators. So yes, while the regulators can and should be watching, the big takeaway here is that data privacy is now informing how consumers are deciding how to spend their money. It's a factor that is coming into all of the other things that we would normally assume they think about, brand perception, pricing, experience, data privacy is now another column of those categories. And so at the end of the day, marketers can assume that their data privacy now has a direct link to their revenue targets. It's not necessarily a tick box issue or a compliance issue anymore. It's a competitive issue. It's a brand reputation issue. And both of those things we know well have an impact on the bottom line. So all the more reason to pay attention. And so we're gonna have a bit of a reality check first of all, and look at the landscape of data privacy. So a quick recap on the story so far. First, first milestone in the journey. Um, almost four years ago, GDPR and CCPA launched. Um, feels like a lot longer than it was, but there you go. Leading us to where we are in 2022, facing our next big milestone in data privacy, which is, of course, the phasing out of third-party cookies on Chrome presumably at the end of 2023, we shall see. So that's the kind of story in the background. Let's have a look at really what that means um, in terms of consumer per perception of data privacy. And this is where we have a little bit of a disappointing truth. So the first insight from our research was when we asked consumers, do you feel like you have control over how your personal information is being used by the companies you interact with? And what we see here, is generally a lot of people saying meh. Um, so those people saying, no, not really. Um, I don't feel like I have control or I'm on the fence. Mm. That's a huge proportion of what we've got here. Um, so that kind of blue and that orange part is just over 65%, which at the end of the day is something after four years of GDPR, we would hope and we would maybe expect to be a lot better. That was obviously the key purpose of bringing in these kind of regulations in the first place. So it's perhaps not quite the picture that we're looking for. Um, but we also wanted to see how much this is changing and this is evolving. So we asked a second question. So over the past 12 months, I've become more conscious of the personal information that I share with companies I interact with. Again, we saw around 60% plus of people saying they agree with that. So that trajectory is again evolving towards more consciousness and perhaps slightly more wariness of what's going on as well. So to add some context here, Florian, I'm going to come to you um, because you've right. you've got the the extra stuff on here. So consumers not necessarily being that open to sharing this much data or this kind of trajectory towards being more conscious. These might not be the kind of pictures that the advertising industry necessarily wants to see. So are these results a surprise for you, knowing what you know day to day? That's, I think looking at these numbers, right, um, that's mostly one of the most important outcomes of the study, um, because it really shows and ultimately, I don't think it's a real surprise. It confirms more or less a trend, right, we've been seeing. And a trend which um, like often I think is being kind of, um, let's say, disregarded or played down in the advertising industry, because often it's just discussed as co cookie fatigue, right? Or the regulation ultimately harming the experience of users. While I think this is something much bigger, right? And um, this is, we've been discussing this with um, partners in the industry for quite a while now. And I think if you look at a few key moments in history, right? Of course, there's GDPR, um, which on the one hand side, the regulators kind of like stepped a bit ahead, right? And said, we feel there's something wrong. So let's um, kind of like create um, or give power to the consumers to change that. But I think there were other moments like Cambridge Analytics, right? Or even the Edward Snowden moments, right? Where information was released to the public that there are huge privacy breaches potentially going on. And I think these were kind of turning points if you look back, right? Um, since And since then this journey has really come back changed. Um, I, I wouldn't say that con consumers have turned into privacy experts, right? Or everyone is reading a bit as a, of a spoiler, right? We'll get to that later in the study, is reading the privacy policies. Um, but I think what we can see is that there is generally an awareness level, which, which has increased. And um, 
I mean, if you look at kind of like the the, um, the evolutions or the peaks of this, look at the Apple iPhone, right? This is being promoted these days as a mass consumer product um, with a core brand message around privacy. Companies such as Apple, right? They wouldn't do it if they wouldn't believe that really consumer, let's say consumer perception, consumer importance, right? On these topics has changed a lot. And um, I think this is kind of like my takeaway here would be it's a trend and it's a trend to be taken serious. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, you mentioned a couple of things there that were very interesting that are drivers, I guess, mm -hmm. of this consumer reticence to share data, you know, Cambridge Analytica, um, amongst other things that we know, such as GDPR. Are there yeah. any, any other kind of catalysts that you see here that are perhaps moving consumers to being a bit more reticent about the data that they share? Yeah, I, I think it's it's actually multiple aspects, right? It's um, besides, let's say, these key moments, right, we just discussed, it's people realize more and more how much time they spend online, how much time they spend on their smartphones, right? Uh, we're often talking about um, like even ultimately, let's say, mental health, right, because you spend too much time on the device. But when you start discussing these things, right, you realize that ultimately you don't only use a smartphone anymore to just share the latest, I don't know, like social posts around your latte art cappuccino, right? But you actually use the phone for everything you do. You use it for your financial statements. You use it for ultimately sharing, potentially even kind of like um, getting you to your payslip, right? All these different elements, which make this phone so personal and the information you share there actually very relevant to everything you do. Um, and I think this is kind of like, most probably that's kind of like also a catalyst, right? Which is not coming directly from regulation or privacy discussions, but it's coming just from more and more consciousness, right? Around the importance of this device. And then link this to news you see every single day, right? Around GDPR fines. You see uh, companies potentially um, going through data breaches, right? Because of hacking attempts. So all these things get linked because immediately you realize, damn it, I'm working with this company, right? For, I don't know, this and that, right? I'm doing in my private life. And suddenly it hits you, right? That this becomes very relevant to you and very relevant to who you work with, who you share your data with, right? And people start thinking about it. And I think these, this triggers the thought process, right? And this is most probably kind of like which sparks this trend and ultimately rather accelerates it than actually stopping it. It's very interesting. It, it kind of provokes a kind of random question for me about how, how things like the internet of things and smart home applications could also be catalyzing this kind of thing by capturing capturing more data in different ways you know everyone's got an alexa um, or a google home or something like that and the suspicion that these devices are listening is a different way of alerting people to how their data might be used but i feel like that's a whole big other conversation for another day that Definitely. we could get into um thanks florian let's move on to to the next section um here so Obviously, there's, there's something amiss here, um, and we wanted to unpack this a little bit further. Um, so what is going wrong? And this is where I'm going to go back to the study that we actually published last year, the study with those marketers. And we asked marketers, how confident are you that your company is complying with data privacy rules? And as you can see here, blue and green was pretty confident. So we actually spread this spectrum across high performers, the top 1%, versus low performers, the bottom tier marketers. And across the board, everyone was super confident, almost 100% confident that they had everything together when it came to data privacy. Perhaps overconfident. Um, and that's why we asked a second question. Um, we asked them whether or not they have a single customer view. And we indexed those two answers together. And what we found was there were a lot of marketers who were very confident that they were doing everything right in terms of data privacy, but they didn't have a single customer view. And that is a disconnect. Um, and those two things can never really truly align. And hopefully the next couple of slides will explain why. Um, so here goes, there's gonna be a lot of moving whooshing imagery that goes within. So the problem within all of this is that obviously in today's digitalized environment, there are so many different touch points for a consumer when it comes to engaging with a business. From what we can see here, you know, you could sign up in store for a loyalty card or you've got emails then being delivered, maybe by a MailChimp. They might put in customer service requests, which might be handled via Zendesk. Throughout all of those things, obviously, they are giving over certain elements of data but of course, they're also setting their consent and marketing preferences at the same time. 
So, you know, on the one hand, when I signed up for my loyalty card, I may well have said yes to marketing communication, but maybe at some point later on when I'm doing something on the website, I might decide no. And unless all of those different disparate tools are being brought together, then I'm going to have different preferences lying all over the place. And then for the marketer who's going to be trying to reach out to me, they are probably going to get their wires crossed. So what essentially we need to be able to do is in the same way that we want to create a clear picture of the customer in creating a single customer view, we want to create a single picture of their consent as well. So across all of those different touch points, we know that the most up-to-date element of consent for SMS is maybe no, but the most up-to-date and accurate um, consent for email says yes. We've then got that single clear picture, which is most up-to-date, so we can work with it going after that. And so that's the kind of thing that a CDP like ours does, obviously, maybe taking your website data, taking your CRM data, taking the consent that has been captured within each of those platforms and unifying it to be able to give you one definitive answer that you can then work with. Without that, you've got disparate answers in different places, wires crossed, customer unhappy. So if that's kind of what's going wrong and hopefully a measure as to how you can fix it, let's start to have a look at what kind of results you can expect as a result of doing so. Um, so let's move it on, sorry, technical difficulties. Um, actually, before we do, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rewind one second. Going back to um, that picture here, uh, going to you, Florian, there's that obvious disconnect between what marketers perceive as having data privacy under control and what consumers are experiencing. So do you think marketers are overconfident? Um, and why do you think that, if you do? I mean, I, I think you kind of like pointed to the answer, right? And um, I mostly agree with it. Um, I think what we have been, in my opinion, there are actually like three challenges at the heart of this, right? Um, the first one is the complexity of digital marketing. Because to ultimately drive compliance, right? And ultimately make sure that you really have compliance across the company, more functions than just the digital marketing team need to understand how digital marketing works and how actually the interaction with the user in digital works. And this is still a big challenge, right? Because it's, um, it's often still kind of like put into this very small team in the company um, who then have to deal with everything. We, we see, and this is a good trend, more and more DPOs going into the weeds, understanding and actually trying to understand how these technologies work to then help the marketing teams, right? And help the business to actually find solutions. So that's a good trend, but overall, this is still a big challenge. So I think complexity of digital marketing, and you could see this best, I think, when GDPR was introduced. So most companies were struggling with the very basics, right? Like, how do I actually phrase a dialogue with users? Um, how do I ultimately introduce a content management platform, right? Something very, today, absolute table stakes, right? You need to have a content management platform on your website, in your app, right? When you actually want to use that data for communication purposes and want to collect data beyond the absolute minimum, right? Which is used for technical purposes. Um, and even still today, there's uncertainty, right? Looking at um, the recent verdicts out of Belgium and so on. Um, but this is the first dimension. The second dimension, in my opinion, is the organizational disconnect. Um, I, I just pointed at kind of like digital marketing be, being isolated, but think further, right? We, we saw the 360 view. So you also have to consider that some of the data is collected in stores, right? If you, for example, look at retail, if you look at telecoms, if you look at other companies, right, who have brick and mortar. Um, so you ultimately have different teams who would handle these stores. You would have teams who would handle cashier systems. You would have teams handling loyalty programs. And so on, right? And ultimately, to, to bring together this 360 view, you need cross-functional teams to really think yeah, beyond organizational borders um, to, to bring together the data, but then also think about the user experience and think about the privacy aspects of this. And this is a hugely complex endeavor right, for any company. That's why we see more and more functions such as digital transformation teams, transformation digital offices, right? however you want to call them, um, who try to kind of like break these boundaries and try to think more from the user centricity argument, right, than anything else. And this is something we kind of like discuss with our clients on a day to day basis. So quite a crucial aspect um, in these considerations. Last one, and I think this is something kind of like might be a bit biased, but um, I still think it's true. There was a lack of tools and software actually in the past, right, to really bring together these different views. I mentioned content management platforms, great tools, right, to collect data from a website or from an app. But how do you then tie content together? with actually content coming from a store, content coming from actually a call center, 
content coming from a website, right? These different elements, tying them together through an identity graph, through profiling, right? Through all the different compliance mechanisms which need to be in place to make the data actionable, even for a marketeer, right? Who might not be a privacy expert again. This is something which just wasn't in place. Um, good news is, right, with kind of like the next generation of um, CDPs, which we see at the moment, for example, ZeroTap, that is changing and that is a good thing. Um, so, yeah, this would be my maybe more than five cents on this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like that, it, I think it just indicates the complexity of the challenge at hand, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how this is, it's not just an issue for a marketer. The marketer is at the receiving end of the consequences in many ways. Um, but they need the support of a wider organization in order to be able to make sure that they can solve it. So um, speaking of consequences, let's go back to um, what those potential upsides and downsides are. So we're kind of going to work through the funnel. Um, but, so first of all, looking at privacy as a purchase driver. So the, the question that we asked here um, was if a company guarantees to a potential customer that they're not going to share their personal information with third parties, are you going to be more likely to buy from them? Answer here, overwhelmingly, yes. Um, big chunk of people that saying they would agree. This is going back to what we mentioned at the very beginning in saying that privacy and how you can communicate that idea of data privacy is now a purchase consideration. Sit that alongside pricing, sit that alongside, I don't know, uh, guarantees and returns policies, for example, it's sitting alongside that in that spectrum. And this is a really clear indication of how far that's come. And um, I mean, uh, Florian alluded to this slightly earlier on, but we also wanted to see how many people actually read the data privacy policy um, when they're buying something as well. Interesting here, um, more than we would perhaps expect. There's obviously a wide spectrum. There's a tiny sliver that said they've done it more than 10 times. And I would love to see the evidence. Um, but still, nonetheless, we've only got a small chunk of people here saying, I don't know. So we've got a com kind of general consciousness when it comes to reading data privacy policies. I think, again, you know, if we looked at this kind of thing five years ago, maybe before GDPR, this might be something very different. Um, I think enough of us as consumers have seen and engaged with consent management platforms now to understand what these kind of things are asking us. So this is a consideration that has gone up the ladder um, when it comes to being a purchase driver, um, which is great in many ways um, for a marketer, because at the end of the day, if you have your ducks in a row, you can use that to your advantage. Um, but I want to zero in on, on actually the first question here. Um, so Florian, back over to you. I mean, this kind of idea of sharing personal information with third parties, um, it's a bit of an assumption here still amongst consumers that that's happening. So if I'm a marketer, or if I'm a brand, what should I be doing to try and correct that assumption if I can? Yeah, um, <laughs> I think mm. this, is, this remains the biggest challenge of digital advertising per se, right? Because the problem you have is you need to communicate something very complex and something which is can take various forms, right, in a very small constant dialogue to a user, right? And you don't want to overwhelm yeah. them with pages of text. You want to make it easy to understand. You want to make it consumer friendly. You want to use your touch points wisely, right? Um, at the same time, you need to ultimately put the most important information in. And that would already be my recommendation. Um, try to be simple in your messaging. Um, rather over communicate a bit than under communicate, right? Maybe put sections in where user can unfold if they want to go deeper. But ultimately, don't underestimate um, kind of like the willingness of users to inform themselves, right? And I think this is important. It's it's talking to users in kind of like an, on eye level, right? And again, you might have ninety percent of the people who really don't care or who just want to get to the experience. That's fine. It just give them the chance, right, to say yes and no while they can still kind of like just see in easy words, right? And maybe just from the titles, that this is something they actually understand what you're talking to them about. Um, but for the other 10%, right, give them the information they need in easy, understandable, maybe with symbols, right? Using um, a proper dialogue, right? What happens when you say yes? What is the data used for? Why, is, where am I, why actually do I collect the data? Who do I share the data with for which purpose? So speaking about these aspects, because maybe if you want to make their experience better, right, across channels, that means you didn't have to share data with other channels to actually message them there, um, connect them in the right way there, right? And some users might say, actually, I don't want that. I, I see a risk in sharing my data, and I'm not okay with that. And then you should accept this, right? But giving that that option and reducing the number of chan uh, channels you actually 
Kavik ask permission for to only the channels you really use. It's kind of, that's where it starts, right? You don't want to overwhelm them with a TCF vendor list of 180, 200, I don't know how many vendors, right? You just include, just to have the option in the future. That is definitely something you shouldn't do, right? You should really focus on the ones where you want to start, who you want to act with, interact with, right? Maybe you have actually already made experience with. Um, so you, you're kind of like this trusted partner, right? Where the moment you list somebody there, you also trust them and you have to show the users that you trust them, right? And that's why you work with them. And I think it's kind of like, it will go step by step, right? And again, many users won't care, some will care. And maybe kind of like, this will help you out of the 10% who care, right? Convince a few more than otherwise you would do. Um, but I think even subconsciously by having easy messaging, having, yeah, kind of like messaging on eye level uh, that helps to build trust and in the long run will win. Uh, and it seems to be very honest at the moment to be the only option, right? Um, mm -hmm. Going into detail, giving them all the options of informing themselves, looking at the latest um, recommendations out of the um, data protection authorities, they want you to give them more information than less, right? Even TCF 2.0 doesn't seem to be sufficient just from the amount of information you communicate around the purposes and um, the information why and who you share data with. So yeah, go into the details, um, give them the option, make it understandable and reduce it to the kind of like the real parties you want to work with. So much to unpack there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think one of the elements that you mentioned is that kind of idea of focus, which we're definitely going to return to later on here because we, we've got a bit more data that, that supports that. Mm. But you know, ultimately, yeah, with what you've said, um, there's there's an opportunity here, I think, for marketers who are doing a good job to be able to leverage that. So, you know, while this idea of consumers being onto you in terms of your data privacy might be construed as something that could be a threat, actually, in many ways, it's an opportunity, um, which leads us on to the kind of next stage of the funnel. So retention driver. Um, so there was a very simple question that we asked here. Um, Basically, if a company attempts to contact you via a channel where you didn't opt in, will you cut ties with that company altogether? And again, we've got nearly 60% saying, yep, uh, <laughs> uh, ra rather unsurprisingly. Um, so look, I mean, at the end of the day, this is, this is not rocket science and this shouldn't be surprising to anybody, but it just shows that going back to our kind of consent orchestration piece earlier on, that the price of mistakes is is very high when it comes to actually using that data. So while it is a mountain to climb in many senses of being able to get a single picture of that consent and to make sure that it works day to day and in real time, it is worth doing because we all know that retention is probably one of the bigger business drivers than even acquisition, depending what kind of business that you're in. And if, if we're seeing that one single mistake could cost you 50%, um, then it's absolutely worth doing. So if you want to build a business case, here's the chart. Um, so we're going to move on um, to kind of our last insight here, but this is privacy as a profit driver. Um, and this was where we wanted to have a look at essentially the cost um, of all of this data in the first place. Um, so we asked a lot of questions uh, around this, basically trying to find out what consumers thought their data was worth to a business and what they're willing to exchange it for. So that first question um, was asking, what kind of personal information would you be willing to share and what would you need to receive in order to get it? So whether it was personalization, whether they would share it for free or whether they would never share it under any circumstance. We looked at things like gender, we looked at more kind of sensitive personal information like banking information. I mean, some people said they'd share it, good for them. Um, but also things like mobile phone number, which we're all accustomed to sharing. And some of the key things that we found, you know, lots of different differentiation there, but the most important one was actually, rather than offering discounts in exchange for that data, it may be more effective to offer personalization instead. Most of the data points that we got here, consumers were saying, I would be more likely to exchange that with a brand in exchange for a personalized service rather than a discount. And this might be to some extent a bit counterintuitive. I think we've always seen that value exchange often coming in the form of discounts for signing up, or is there a kind of free incentive um, in order to hand over your data? This goes against the grain here. And again, it's interesting going back to what we were saying before, what Florian was saying before about the kind of information that you give over in order to ask somebody for their data. 
and you know showing that you might personalize instead maybe the kind of information that they need in order to do so so that was kind of our first little bit of insight but we also wanted to find out exactly what consumers think their data is worth um so i think this uh very interesting um we again looked at all of these different data points and said okay if a brand could buy that information about you how much do you think they would spend um the general trends uh, as you would expect the more sensitive the information the more consumers thought it would cost but what we did find was actually they thought it would cost quite a lot so nearly 50% there saying that their email address is worth more than $50 over 50% saying their mobile number is worth the same if you have a look closely at the chart which of course i'm sure you can do in your own time afterwards huge swathes of that dark blue are people saying their data is worth more than $100 so some very interesting stuff here um again like a, a lot of different shifts in perception but um Fundamentally, I think it, the indication here is that consumers are very conscious that data is the new oil, that phrase that we've heard millions of times before. Um, so Florian, I'm gonna come back to what you were touching on before about kind of data focus. Um, cookie-less future, it's obviously coming. Everyone's saying you have to collect first party data in order to survive. So how should a brand approach gathering the data that they need without asking too much, without asking for a consumer to, to give everything away without offering enough value for it? It's, um, I think, I mean, these numbers indicate a very big challenge, right? Um, that's, and maybe also even a danger. Um, if you're heading down the path, right, of trying to now incentivize users, um, you can see the expectations here, right? Um, and this, this gets very costly quickly. I mean, if you're coming from the marketing industry, right, you often speak about CPM, which is cost per mil, right? We all know how important target or like how important targeting data or kind of like personalization data is ultimately, right? But we also know how much is being paid in the market um, for actually having that data available, right? Going down to platforms where it might even be given away for free, right? Um, question like putting the question of quality aside. Um, so ultimately, this is um, where there is a disconnect, clearly, right? And this is a, this is a challenge, as I think always will be. Um, if you're looking now at um, how to approach it, I think it's ultimately be transparent. Um, we saw the kind of chance of personalization, right, as a key argument for users to be convinced. Um, so talk to them about it. Talk to them about why you want the data, why what you need it for, and what you use it for. And ultimately, make a very clear plan of what you want to achieve, how you can achieve it, and then reduce the data collection to the minimum, right? Um, and I think this is, it starts very kind of like, like even hard-coded in the law, right? If you look at the GDPR, it says you have to minimize the data, right, to really the data you just need. It is not a blanket um, kind of like, you cannot collect consent and then just collect everything you can get just for the sake because you have consent. This is not how you build trust, right? And this might even be against the law. So um, you have to be very careful there. And I think this comes down to really understanding your business, understanding what you want to do, having very good advisors in the digital marketing space, in the say, digital experience and personalization space, because you really want to do this right, right? And you want to set up your processes, your concept collection, et cetera. I'm not saying this is a dynamic process, always will be, but still kind of like um, try to think it through um, and ultimately start kind of like with the things you really need um, and then communicate them properly. And I think that's the best advice you can give at the moment. Um, and let's see if, um, I think it's also learning from the industry and what others do, right? It's a constant kind of like trying, um, you could call it a constant A-B testing, right? Um, but follow what the leaders are doing in that space. Um, partners such as us, right? Like we are definitely in the market as well to exchange best practices of what we see with other clients. Um, and ultimately, yeah, sharing things which work, right? Um, to, to make it easier, to make it more effective and um, yeah, get to better results with your customers, help them come back to have a better, more personalized experience um, and ultimately understand them better to um, address them better, I, I think. Thank you. I mean, I think like this, this leads us quite nicely onto our kind of final thoughts slash to-do list um, to sum up what we've gone through before we dive into everyone's questions. So to keep it short and simple, um, I think first of all, when it comes to purchase, I think our key takeaway here is about putting data privacy on the front page um, to be able to, when you have your house in order, of course, um, to be able to use that as a competitive asset um, and not to be something that one shoves under the carpet 
or leaves for a consumer to find if they're the ones looking out for it. If this is something that we have together, this is something to really demonstrate as part of the brand. It's an opportunity as much as it is a risk, which helps drive purchase. Moving on further, retention. I think the, the simple, straightforward answer, even that it's not necessarily simple and straightforward to execute, is to build that single consent view. Um, in order to have your house in order and to have everything watertight, this is probably the most important thing that you need to do. Um, and like we've said before, it's not just an action for marketing. It's not just an action for digital marketing. It's, it's a company-wide initiative in order to make sure um, that all of these disparate sources of data, these disparate sources of consent are being properly rationalized so that you can execute without fear that you're going to be making a mistake that could cost you substantially in that terms of lifetime view. And then finally, thinking about profit. So yeah, like Florian was saying, really critique the data that you're collecting um, and what you're exchanging for it at the end of the day. Um, there is an element of friction and attrition in trying to do this. So it helps to make sure that the only things that you are asking for are the things that you really need. And you are associating the right kind of message and the right kind of value with it as you go along. So short to-do list, not necessarily the most simple to execute, but we'll leave that with you. So um, before we move on to questions very quickly, um, just a heads up that all of this stuff and more is included in the report, the value exchange, which we just published. Um, it's available for download for free on our website. If you haven't already seen it, we will include a link to it in the follow-up that comes with the recording as well. So many more data points there for you guys to unpack. So all of that being done, um, I think we'll move over to your questions. Um, and I think we have a couple of minutes. Oh, apologies for some reason. Technical issues, as always. Um, so I think we've got about five minutes to be able to take questions and I'm gonna dive right in to see what we've got. I'm gonna fire them all at you, Florian. Um, so if you were in a marketer's shoes right now, looking at our kind of little to-do list that we just talked about, where, where would you start? Because this seems like potentially a little bit of an overwhelming picture. How would you begin? Yeah, um, and I think I also have to correct myself there a bit, right? Like about this kind of like analyze everything and then only collect the data you need. Um, I think this is just not how reality often works. I think typically, and um, if you really get into a project, it's looking at a very specific use case, what you want to achieve, right? Like it's how you want to address a certain group of users for a certain purpose in a certain channel, for example. So I'm just saying one channel. Um, and that could be a starting point, right? Then backtracking this and seeing where do I start, where the systems I have the data, do I have the necessary contents to do this use case? If not, how do I change this, right? Of course, try to make it as modular as possible so you can increase and improve kind of like your messaging in the future, but start somewhere. So I think it's, it typically really comes down to this crawl, walk, run approach, right? Of starting yeah. somewhere and trying to, of course, right? Get the messaging right, as right as possible, but you will always have to improve, right? And there's always new learnings you make along the way. So I think it's, Pick a use case, think it through, involve everybody in the organization, right, um, to get them on board, explain what you're trying to do, get the buy-ins. Often it is the sales teams, often it is the user engagement teams, right? Um, sometimes it's the, um, the web design teams, et cetera. So everybody who might be involved in that journey, right, you're trying to build, get them on board, um, share the message um, and advocate for what you are trying to do there. Um, find a sponsor and then, yeah, start with a simple use case, bring that live. I don't even say buy a tool yet, right? It, it might be that you really do this with what you have in place um, to understand the journey and learn, right? And then you will see what you need along the way. Um, and of course, right, we would arguably, arguably say that constant orchestration becomes a, a challenge very quickly. Um, but I would say in general, start with something very simple. That would be my key recommendation. I think that's... Um... That's good advice and also reassuring advice um, for, for someone that could assume looking at this, that this is this is a huge beast of a challenge. If you can actually break it down and look at it iteratively, then it helps to get started. I mean, you may not need to unify absolutely every source of data straight away. You could maybe take two or three, depending on the channels that you really need to communicate on. So it's good. Um, looking at the time, I think one more question. Um, and this is actually one from me. Um, so, Florian, if I was going to do this survey again next year, um, would you expect anything to change from what we've seen today? This is, 
I think um, I mentioned a few trend elements, right, when it came to consumer behavior before. And I don't see this changing, to be very honest. I think um, everything going on in the world, right, like also hacking being a major element of the news, right, everywhere. I think um, often IT security is very closely linked with privacy. Yeah. Um, and it, like by design, it's not, right, because it's two different things. But it's about, for the consumer, it can be the same when they look at a company. Because it's about building trust, trusting the company with something very valuable, your personal data, information about yourself, right? And that is um, where I feel also the elements around privacy will often be just thrown into one bucket, but it means ultimately you also need to get your stuff done right on the privacy side. Additionally, right, there are, um, I mean, of course, you have elements um, such as the cookie going away. That means messaging will change in the marketing industry. Companies will ask for new things, right, that might even increase awareness of the users again. So I don't think kind of like this topic is, is going anywhere, right? Um, I think um, we will see increased awareness, maybe, um, but at least kind of like um, mostly a bit more detailed questions asked from the consumers. Um, and yeah, I think we will see a first kind of like differentiation of companies doing this really well and potentially already seeing an impact, right? Um, of um, not only kind of like the downside protection, right? Which you, you pointed at, like the potential loss, but also an upside um, where companies who do this really well um, can even profit from this, right? And, um, and see a stronger upturn than others. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think definitely reasons to be cheerful and reasons to be optimistic as a marketer based on all of this, yeah. as well as those reasons to be cautious, which we all know about. Um, yeah, I mean, let's see if we do the study again next year. Maybe if we do it again in five years when cookies are well and truly dead and buried in their graves, we might see something that's even more different when we know what those post cookie solutions look like in more detail, who knows? Um, but I think that leads us to our conclusion today. So a massive thank you to Florian for joining me today and offering all of his insights. Um, and a massive thank you to everyone who's dialed in. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you found it useful interesting, maybe even entertaining, who knows? Um, we have many more webinars that are gonna be coming up over the next couple of months as well on similar topics, um, as well as a few different ones. So we hope to see you for a few of those. If you have any feedback, any questions, any requests, please do drop me a line and hopefully we'll see you next time. Thank you and bye-bye. Thanks a lot from my side as well. See you soon. Thank bye -bye. you, bye.